probably the main point of 4.4 in general is to be able to graph sine and cosine graphs. So what I'm going to take you through here is an, uh, an example which is going to be in a lot more detail, messy detail, than you will ever have to do from here on out. But I just wanted to show you where these graphs come from before we start doing transformations on them. So uh, to preface that, I want to just talk about these new definitions that we're going to have for sine, cosine, and tangent. So this is the last time we're going to redefine these. Uh, but we have sine, cosine, and tangent. Notice that they're not quite what we expect. At the very beginning, we saw that sine was opposite over hypotenuse. Well, then we changed it to sine is equal to y over r in terms of y, r, and x. And now we're going to redefine this one more time. We're going to say that sine is equal to y and similar thing with cosine. Tangent and cotangent are going to stay exactly the same, and you'll see why here in a little bit, basically because we don't use radius. But one thing I want to mention about these is the fact that, um, you know, sine is normally, if we were going to say sine of theta or sine of t or whatever variable you want to use, you would say that that's y over r. And then also normally you would say that cosine is x over r. Now in the case of the unit circle, which is what we can assume we're working with all the time, the interesting thing is that the unit circle will always have the fact that r is equal to 1. That's a really important fact here because if we have y over r is the same thing as y over 1, that means it's just equal to y. And if we have x over R, that's really x over 1, which means just plain x. And so you'll notice here now that sine and cosine are just defined by y and x. Now that's, an, that's going to be kind of a convenient thing for us when we're graphing because if I want to know the sine value at a particular angle, all I have to do is look at the y value. So I'm just going to go through on this unit circle right now and I'm just going to underline the y value for each and every one of these because that's really all I need to know when I'm graphing sine. So I'll go through here, I get all these y values, and then we're actually gonna go and draw a graph using those values. So uh, you may want to get a copy of this in front of you, maybe on a different device, uh, because I'm gonna be referring back to this, but I'm gonna kinda going back and forth, so it might be helpful to have that sitting somewhere else so that you can follow along a little bit easier. I'm also going to be checking decimal numbers on the calculator, so that's all something that you might want to have, or you can take my word for it. It's up to you as far as that goes. But what I've got here is a grid on which I'm going to graph my sine function. Now I'm only going to do this for sine, I'm not going to do this for cosine because there's really not much point in doing that. If you see one, then you could probably believe me that the other one works too. Uh, one thing to note on this graph, what I have going on here in my grid, this is going to be positive one, this is going to be negative one. Because on the unit circle, those are the highest and lowest values respectively for the y values. If we go back here, you'll notice that the highest y value is 1, the smallest y value is negative 1. So we're going in between those. All right, so we've got 1 and negative 1. That means that this is negative 0.5 and this is 0.5. Now, the other thing is on the horizontal grid, we've got all these little tick marks and you'll notice that some of them aren't spaced evenly between each other. That's because these are all of the special angles within one turn of the unit circle. So this is pi over 6, pi over 4, pi over 3, and so on. But I'm just going to start splitting this up. So we have 2 pi at the very end. In the middle, halfway around the circle is pi. And then we've got pi over 2 in the middle of that. We've got 3 pi over 2 in the middle of those two. And so all these in between, I just my, my marker's probably not sharp enough to even write all of those. Uh, but maybe I'll do the pi over 4 is just so you have uh, a little bit of perspective of where those are at. So that's pi over 4. This one's going to be 3 pi over 4. Then we've got 5 pi over 4. And uh, the last quadrant would be 7 pi over 4. So what's happening here is basically we're unrolling 
the unit circle into the x-axis. And so it's it's a little bit weird to to wrap your brain around for for the little for the first part of it, but hopefully it it'll work out for you here in a second. All right, now when we graph this, we're going to start at zero. So if the x value is zero, if we do sine of zero, that means that we're going back to our unit circle and we're saying what is the y value at the angle zero? Well, the y value is zero, so at zero it's zero, and we get a point on that one right there. So sine's always going to start at the origin. Next is pi over six. So that pi over six angle, same thing as the 30 degree angle that's right here, that's going to be a y value of one half. So I'll put that on my grid so I get a dot here. That's not too bad. That's pretty easy. And then pi over four, our y value is square root of two over two. Now I said the calculator was going to come into play here. Square root of two over two, oops, is not one. That was not right. Square root of two. Got to close the parentheses there. That looks better. All right, so it's about 0 0.71. So right up here, just a little bit below that one, maybe like that. Okay, then pi over six. Okay, so pi over six, excuse me, pi over three, the 60 degree angle. Now our y value is square root of three over two. All right, and so I'll try this again. Hopefully I'll be a little bit more successful this time. Square root of three divided by two is about 0.866. So maybe that's like maybe right about here. And then finally, the last one, at least to get the pattern anyway, the last one that I have is pi over two, uh, or the 90 degree angle, and so that one, uh, the y value there is just positive one, and that's you know kind of nice that we have that as a good value. So you'll, you're starting to see a little bit of a trend here. What we're gonna do with this is we're gonna take it a little bit further, but we're just going to mirror the values over to this side. So now we're, we're delving into the second quadrant, and so it's gonna be the same y values in the second quadrant. I'm just gonna continue this on until we get back to pi. And so notice that we've got this shape, it's this rounded shape that goes back to the origin, or back to the axis once we hit pi. And that's because at pi, we have a y value of zero. So again, we're just tracking the y value. Now, at this point, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to keep going with all those little values. So I'm gonna shortcut it a little bit and we can expect to see a pattern here. So the next one I'll go to, just because it's a really important point, is down here at 270 or at three pi over two. That y value is gonna be negative one. And so that's down here at negative one. And then if we go back all the way to the beginning, now we're at two pi, basically a zero. That's going back to zero for the y value, and so we plot that one as well. Um, you can see the pattern is just a negative version of what we started with. And so I'm gonna just fill in the rest like this. So what this is here for, this is not something that you're gonna be doing in your assignment or, or on a test or anything, but this is just to uh, kind of get you the idea that this actually works, that this actually is the shape of the sine graph. It's just a little bit of an evidence for that. So you can, uh, I will show you some methods in these next ones where it'll be a lot simpler, it'll be a lot more, uh, just get the, the very basics, but hopefully that gives you a little idea where the, the shape of the sine graph comes from.